Hi, it's me, uh, Rich Piccarelli. I've been jumping for uh, 49 years. Uh, April 2nd uh, at the Riverside Air Show, I will make, um, it'll be my 50th anniversary that day. It coincides with uh, the air show. But uh, that's a long story. Um, I am uh, here at Paris, the drop zone. Um, I jumped here yesterday and we made a 38 way. Uh, which was a lot of fun. We tried for a 40, but we couldn't do it. Um, yeah, um, I'm unique in that I started jumping on the uh, East Coast. I made a thousand jumps there, and then I moved out to California in 1970, and I'm glad I did that because the weather is so good out here. And um, um, I forgot to mention that I'm doing this for EFS. Uh, eternal Friends of Skydiving, and I don't know where this is going to go, but I hope it helps the cause. Um, so, uh, yeah, I started uh, I started working at PI, Parachutes Incorporated, in Lakewood, New Jersey. It was uh, 1967. Uh, I made my first jump. Uh, when I had 90 jumps, I became a jump master. And that's the story I'll tell, how I became a jump master. Because... The story has been told by uh, Bill Otley in Parachutist Magazine and recently Gil Foyle, Lee Gilfoyle on uh, Facebook. And um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell the story as close as I can remember it. Um, and it's funny how your memory changes. So uh, just a brief history. I, I worked for PI at Lakewood, then I worked for PI at... Uh, uh, Orange, Massachusetts for a year or two. I got fired three times and hired back at PI. I had the world's record. Um, Jacques Estelle uh, was and is my friend. Off and on, it depends on how he feels. And uh, uh, he sent me out to California to get a pilot's license. And uh, I learned how to fly out here in 1969, 1970. And then I went back there, and Vic Valley, the pilot, didn't like me, so the, he was the chief pilot. So I got fired again, and uh, I came out to California and started doing relative work. I got on Jerry Bird's All-Stars. Uh, that got me to the Nationals in 1972. We took first place. That got us invited back uh, three weeks later for the World Meet in 1972 uh, to give a relative work exhibition. We made... 26 free jumps out of UE helicopters. Uh, I thought I died and went to heaven. Um, and uh, then uh, I, I kind of got burned out with uh, competition. 1972, 1973, I started hang gliding. Um, uh, I converted a tow kite that you tow behind uh, ski boats to a hang glider that I could run off of mountains. Uh, I started test flying for Bill Bennett Delta Wing Kites. Um, and um, he sent me all over the world uh, doing hang gliding demonstrations, teaching hang gliding. And uh, as this was happening, uh, this was like the beginning of hang gliding. It was a very exciting time. It was kind of like Lakewood was in 19... 67 with uh, uh, sport parachuting, you know, and uh, so unfortunately everybody was dying across the country. A lot of jumpers were getting into hang gliding, and uh, they were getting killed left and right because there were no instructors, there were no standards. People would make their own gliders and run off the mountains and die. But I was a master rigger, thanks to Chuck Embry at uh, the parachute. Uh, Parachutes Incorporated Equipment Division. Um, I, I learned how to pack parachutes there. I learned how to sew. Became a master rigger on the West Coast. But I took that knowledge and I designed a parachute that you could uh, uh, wear on your chest. And if you had a mid-air collision or if you had a heart attack or if you passed out from hypoxia um, or if you had any kind of a problem up there, you could um, let's say you flew into some really bad turbulence. Um, a lot of people uh, lost their lives that way. So this parachute enabled you to 
open it up with uh, Velcro closure um, and uh, throw it as far as you could throw it. And it was rigged so it couldn't open until it was 25 feet away from the hang glider. And, um, and uh, I did a bunch of test jumping and it's all on video. Uh, Carl took some of it. Uh, and uh, we started selling these things through Bill Bennett Delta Wing Kite and we sold, uh, in one year we sold a thousand of them and every time one got sold I got ten bucks and uh, then the, the uh, Japanese people started copying it so Bill Bennett stopped giving me my, uh, my little uh, uh, ten dollars a parachute but uh, the main thing is it was never patented or anything like that because we were in a hurry to have it out on the market and uh, it saved hundreds and hundreds of lives. It saved my best friend's life, Jeff Fogelman. Uh, he wouldn't wear the parachute or he wouldn't buy one so I gave him one and a week later he needed it and uh, it saved his life. Uh, but anyway, um, that, uh, that uh, I couldn't stop jumping. Uh, when when hang gliding got old, I, w I started jumping again. The longest I ever went without a jump was four months. And um, I, I made a lot of jumps out of uh, hang gliders. And uh, one time I, fl I piloted a hang glider and I had Jim Hanbury on the right side of me and, um, and Brian Johnson on the left side of me. And uh, we took off the top of Half Dome in Yosemite illegally and uh, we got out over the valley over Mirror Lake and uh, that's how I became a jump pilot as well um, and uh, so Jim and uh, Brian left the hang glider and made it two-way and uh, then I had to land down on the peninsula uh, where they landed their parachutes with this giant family-sized hang glider and, uh, and I had to go to jail overnight and uh, it was all prearranged. We knew we were going to get busted, but uh, Carl said he would bail me out if I got put in jail, and he did the next morning. So, but the fantastic the fantastic video is available now on Facebook, uh, thanks to Randy Forbes uh, with a short story. So, please see that. And there's about 20 other episodes that we're posting every two weeks on Facebook uh, with a story that I write just to keep the story straight. Um, so then I became a pilot and I flew my Cessna 182 to Russia one time, uh, up through Canada, across Alaska, and uh, stayed overnight in Providenia, Russia with a bogus visa. And uh, I had to, get a, uh, had to get permission from uh, Moscow. Uh, they, they give you a number that you read over the radio to the military base, and then they let you land in Providenia. Um, so uh, that, that was, uh, I got to make a jump on that trip. Uh, I landed at the side door of the FISDO office, FAA FISDO office, um, right in front of a picture window um, uh, at the FISDO office, right on the Nome Airport. It, that was, that was uh, they let me do that. That was uh, a lot of fun. But uh, it, two years after that, I flew my Cessna 182 to Greenland. Um, I could only land, be, the winds the next day were going to be so strong from the west that I couldn't get back so we had to get a hamburger and turn around and go back to uh, Baffin Island as fast as we could before this storm was coming in. And we did it. Um, it was a three and a half hour crossing over icebergs and uh, I had an 80 gallon, 80 gallon tanks in that 182. and. Uh, and that was a real challenge. But anyway, the story I want to tell is how I became a jump master. And uh, Lee Guilfoyle told this story on Facebook, and um, Bill Otley wrote uh, an article in an article about this uh, this particular jump. I think I had 70 jumps, maybe 80 jumps. It's in my logbook. Um, I was dropping. Uh, I was dropping. Um, I wasn't a jump master yet. I was just a fun jumper, okay, with 70 jumps. And they would always put me in the co-pilot seat of the Norseman. It carried nine jumpers. 
because I was small and I could fit in there and I could get out in and out eas easily. Um, my girlfriend was on this particular flight um, and uh, and she had about, I'm thinking, 30 jumps or 20 or 30 jumps. She was making her uh, first 15 second delay or something like that. The jump master, his name was Oscar Mendez. And, um, and uh, anyway, the jump master, so he could get around in the airplane putting static line students out, would keep his reserve parachute under the battery box seat. And uh, so we got up to about 1,800 feet over Lakewood, New Jersey, and the, um, the engine, uh, I shouldn't say the engine, the propeller blew a prop seal, and oil just covered, hot oil covered the windshield. And Bob Moray, uh, who was the pilot, yelled to me, tell Oscar to get everybody out. And, um, and he was going to make a pass over the great big uh, target area at Lakewood. It was a big sandy bowl. And um, Oscar thought the airplane was going to crash. He thought he was, you know, it was, it was life and death. So he grabbed his reserve, he put it under his left arm, and he uh, opened his parachute and um, started floating down to the sandy target area. And um, so now there's like seven other, seven or eight other people in the airplane. And um, I ran to the back of the airplane, I put out two static line students, I told two more to use the reserve parachutes, I told Sylvia, my girlfriend, to use uh, she, we still had enough altitude. I don't think she used her reserve. But long story short, everybody got out and everybody lived. Uh, I was the last one out. I was sitting on the floor of the Norseman. And it wasn't, we weren't um, high enough for a free fall, so I pulled my reserve in the door of the airplane and just followed it out. And it didn't hit the tail, luckily. And, um, and uh, I was, uh, and by that time we were past the drop zone. And it was an unsteerable 24-foot twill. And I was oscillating badly, and uh, I oscillated onto the runway. So uh, poor Bob Murray, who was flying with his head outside the airplane because he couldn't see through the windshield, and his face was covered with, uh, with uh, black hot oil. Um, he looked like, um, he looked like uh, a colored person. Anyway, uh, he uh, he had to go around because I was landing on the I was landing on the runway, so he he was the real hero of the day. Let me tell you, because he landed the airplane without crashing it after I ran off the runway with my reserve chute, and um, and so what I found out was after I landed that Oscar had realized the mistake he had made and went to his car. And it was about 100, 200 yards uh, away from the drop zone. Put his parachute in the trunk and left the drop zone, and was never seen again. But uh, Lee Guilfoyle uh, hired me as a jump master on the spot, and uh, I was probably the youngest jump master that was ever uh, hired at at uh, Parachutes Incorporated, Lakewood, New Jersey. Um, and I wish it was on video, <laughs> like all my other adventures are on video now. Um, by the way, if you want to see any of these adventures, and, and they're too numerous to count, and I kept a hang gliding journal, and I kept a parachute, my, my, uh, my parachuting logbooks are impeccable, they're very accurate, so uh, if, if you ever want to see any of these stories on video, see Randy Forbes, he's helping me to transfer the, the images and to uh, dress it up so it's good enough to show on Facebook. And all these episodes have narration and music, by the way. So I invite you all to watch this stuff. And um, let's see, to finish, I just want to say that... Um, I would like to thank uh, the YMCA. And if you can contribute to a YMCA anywhere, do it. Because they help people. Um, they give kids things to do so they don't steal hubcaps and do drugs. Thank you.